Plants are kind of the most important thing on Earth, as they are the basis of every terrestrial ecosystem and make all sorts of neat things like air and food nutrients, which you know, we need to live. But like appreciating plants and not just seeing a green background can be hard because it can be easy to miss the forest through the trees while also missing the trees in the forest. And so instead of being confused by the amorphous tangle of plant life, you would rather just get distracted by birds or monkeys or something. But I also guess it can be hard to appreciate and talk about plants because the study of plants, botany, can be a little intimidating with all its very specific vocabulary and because you have all this plant taxonomy, morphology, ecology, cell biology, and biochemistry that our animal, and by that I mean human-centered teaching of biology, ignores. Except that photosynthesis stuff. Because we could not exist without it. And like, come on, plants split water during photosynthesis. Like, that just sounds cool. They split water. Because of this human bias in science education, I myself only have a passing understanding of botany, which is why I wanted to create a video as a remedial lesson on botany and plant communities. But such a video needs the right setting, and what setting could be better than the Amazon rainforest? Arguably the most famous forest on Earth, home to countless animals, fungi, and plants. In this part of the rainforest, in southeastern Peru, we are in the southwest Amazon moist forest ecoregion, home to the highest biodiversity of birds and mammals in the entire Amazon basin. But we are going to forget about all those motel critters, because we are here to talk about the plants. Okay, I guess I should be clear about what this video is and what this video isn't. This is not an advanced video, just going over some basic botanical physiology and ecology, discussing different plant communities in the Amazon, a few interesting plants, the basic vocabulary of plant morphology, and how plants defend themselves from herbivores. Okay, does that seem good? Great, let's continue. So despite this all being one ecoregion and just looking like a quilt of green from above, it is just like a quilt in that the forest is made up of slightly different microhabitats with their own plant communities. Now we enter the wandering around the Amazon portion of the video and start exploring different microhabitats, starting in the Bajio. Basically, the Bajio is a term for forests growing in low-lying areas where the sediments have been deposited in the last 11,000 years. The Bajio is sort of a muddy mire that is kind of just terrible to try and walk around in at its best, and like flooded at its worst. Not an ideal vacation spot. Anyway, we're down here in uh, Bajio, Bajio uh, but this is forest that's seasonally flooded by the river. Here's one of the couple of plant families I know. These are Melastomatastaceae, um, which have these really distinctive sort of multiple ribs going uh, towards the end of the leaf and then a lot in between. They're a really common uh, plant family group. It's all muddy. Ah, here we go. This is really cool. Some people found this. This is a jaguar track, or possibly a puma, but a very large cat came through here. Look at this. This is a strangler fig. See its huge roots. Um, you can see it kind of strangling this. It, I'm not sure if, I think this is all a fig. But yeah, you can kind of see how there's just all this, these sort of these big growths, which are the roots of the tree, which then create the trunk as it sort of engulfs its host tree before strangling and killing it. But they're a super cool piece of uh, um, tropical ecology. And oh, here we go. So this is one that's been cut open probably by some sort of animal up in the canopy. And you can see the flowers inside. That's the fruit that we think of as a fig, but it's not a fruit because a fruit is made out of um, the flower. There's stuff up there. Probably monkeys. Now we're in the swamp. So the nearby Madre de Dios River is a whitewater river, which means the water is full of sediments from the Andes Mountains, giving it the color of a Starbucks coffee with way too little cream. During the true rainy season where it rains most of the time, and not just some of the time, the river floods its banks and flows into the forest and complex landscape of ever-changing oxbow lakes, depositing those creamy mountain sediments in the forest, forming a habitat known as Varzia, 
This is a great place for plants that can survive being completely inundated by muddy water, because each year the soil's nutrients are replenished by the river. This is how I know we're in the swamp. This is a sketchy, sketchy boardwalk. Yeah, another good example of a Melastomastaceae. We're in a bit more of an open area, heading into more of a palm swamp area. You can see all the palm trees, and you can see these big root buttresses for these palms. In this habitat grows this plant, Socratia exoriza, or the walking palm, because some guy who was up way too late watching the day of the triffids thought the plant actually walks across the forest floor, with new stilt roots growing as old ones break. And while it seems seedlings can right themselves if knocked over, Botanists have pretty thoroughly debunked the claim they slowly walk across the forest floor to patches of sunlight. It seems instead, the roots give the palm general stability, letting the plant grow taller than it could without them. In this wet, mucky landscape, oxbow lakes or cochas form interesting little ecosystems. They are formed because water is lazy and always takes the path of least resistance. And so in this landscape where rivers meander chaotically all over the jungle, whenever the river gets the chance because erosion creates a shortcut, it abandons old river bends, leaving behind a lake. Over time, the lake will go through several stages as it ages, until its eventual death. Coaches start deep like this particular lake, home to a diverse community of aquatic organisms. Then, over time, they begin to fill with dead plant material. Note the color change from muddy coffee to urine yellow. Then, eventually, so much plant matter fills the cocha it becomes a lush swamp, thick with vegetation. Eventually, more and more plants fill in, until it is completely reclaimed by the Bajio. At slightly higher elevation are the palm swamps, dominated by the species Mauritia flexuosa. This is even more of a swampy mire than the Bajio, and home to large reptiles. In this swamp, some palms grow around a blackwater lake. The lake looks like an oversteeped tea, because it kind of is, with the color provided by plant tannins, which are very complex chemicals plants use to defend themselves, but let's put a biochemistry pin in that for later. Now we can finally leave the mud and muck of the floodplain and lower elevations and head up into the Altura. Altura are forests growing on sediments deposited more than 11,000 years ago and have now been uplifted high above the river. Like the Bajo, Altura is made up of many different microhabitats. This is where you can find the crown jewel of the tropics, Terra Firme Primary Forest. These are the old growth primary forests of the Amazon. Oh, that's a tree. Oh, that's a tree and a half. That is a rainforest giant. Absolutely massive tree. Wow. This is a forest of giants, particularly the mighty Brazil nut, a large tree in the plant family Lexithidaceae. So here we have a Brazil nut, which, or a Constania tree, which is one of the indicators that you are in terra firme forest in the Amazon basin. I'm going to give it a hug so I can say that I've hugged a tree in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and they're really cool. Um, they have these special seed pods. Let's try and find one. Um, the leaf litter is very thick here. Here's one. And this is, so this is their seed, or their fruit, and inside is all the seeds. And the only animal that can get in here is an agouti, which is a kind of large rodent that lives on the forest floor. And they make these chew holes inside the fruit to pull out the seeds. And then they go hide seeds uh, throughout the forest floor. But agoutis, uh, though they have a pretty good memory, don't have a perfect memory. And so seeds get left out there, and agouti are really tasty. And so predators eat them. And so seeds get left out there. And then when a tree happens to fall in the Amazon rainforest, it creates a light gap. And with any luck, a Brazil nut will rise out above the canopy. and. Yeah, that's the, 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 the ballad of the agouti, the Brazil nut, and the Amazon basin. 
primary forest can only exist without disturbance, and so disturbance creates a patchwork of other habitats throughout the Altura. Sometimes this is natural like with a tree fall. Here we have an old tree fall, and so we have a light gap. So you can see we have trees all around us, and then just a whole bunch of plants fighting to be the next plant in the sun. Um, I see some cercopia over there, which are one of the fastest growing trees, and so they kind of um, are the first tree to fill in before these older, larger hardwood rainforest trees can one can fill this spot. Um, yeah, so these those are some big palmate leaves. But yeah, this is a nice light gap. So when a tree falls in the forest, um, this is what you get, and then just get a thicket of tangled bushes. And eventually a big tree will grow up in here and shade everything out. Increasingly, however, human activity has caused many disturbances in the forest across the Amazon basin. These disturbances often lead to secondary forests, immature forests, teenage forests if you will, still working out their identity, having young trees and a dense understory. This is all uh, secondary growth because it's so thick through there. Because I guess the, the proper term for jungle is more secondary growth because you can't really get through it. Whereas primary rainforest has a nice open floor. Uh, here we have a heliconia. Uh, heliconia is a really good plant to talk about because that is not a flower. That is a brack, which is a highly specialized um, leaf that covers the flower. The flower is actually inside the brack. But it's like we're slowly going deeper and deeper in the can and then the sort of the forest floor is opening up more and more as we kind of enter more primary forest. Out of the forest and into a bamboo thicket. It's insane. It just This is the Amazon and you have these big bamboo thickets. And look at the spines on this plant. The plant is just evil. It has so many spines. Amongst the primary and secondary forests, some patches have been more disturbed and now are impenetrable thickets of guadua bamboo. These giant grasses are armed with giant spines, which, let's put a pin, maybe more of a stake really, in that for a few minutes. This bamboo is also incredibly strong, being the strongest bamboo in the world, often used in construction. Now that you're familiar with the microhabitats of the Amazon basin, I wanted to get into some plant morphology, more specifically go over how to identify leaf shapes. Kind of the first thing I want to kind of talk about is basic, some basic plant growth. Basically plants grow on with nodes, so that is where basically uh, growth happens. So this would be a node, and basically there's node and inner node space. So inner node space is places between nodes like this. Where a node, this is a nice node, that's a node. Um, basic um, plant growth. Um, and then we have leaves, which are attached by the petiole, which is this little bit here, and then you got your main leaf. Um, it's very simple. Uh, what we can talk about, I want to talk about some leaf shapes. Okay, I want to do a leaf shape um, scavenger hunt really quick because I think that that's a great idea. So what is this? It has a drip tip so when the rain falls it'll slip off it. It's Melastoma stacy and it's covered in ants. I think it, I think the correct term when it has a drip tip is aristate. Um, so these are aristate leaves. All right, here we go. Now these are even pinnate leaves. Um, you can see the uh, the petiole is all the way back here, and then um, the rest of this is just broken up leaflets. And so that is um, this is a wacky leaf. It's like what am I looking at? They're like trifoliate, I think. Yeah, this is a wacky leaf you got. Um, your petiole way back here, and then you got these two leaves. Um, this would be opposite, I believe. 
here we go. Here's um, a palmate leaf. You can see how it's like a hand. Um, yeah, so that is a palmate leaf. Palmate leaf. They're just like a typical elliptic leaf, but um, these sort of these just sort of single lines I think make them dentate. I'm trying to I'm trying to learn this leaf stuff with you, um, which is maybe not the greatest thing, but botany is confusing and has a lot of its own words. Now that's a really pretty Melastoma stacy. It's got um, beautiful red color underneath and this like nice dark green on top. That's a gorgeous plant. Ah, there's some chordate leaves. They look like hearts. I think those are pedate. The vine right there where it's kind of like it has the five things but they're all separated. I think it's like a palmate leaf but they're separate leaflets now. Do I think this might be odd pinate? Actually it's opposite. So they're not even. You have one, two, three, four, and they're not in pairs like with a proper pinate leaf where they're going to be kind of right next to each other. So that's an opposite leaf. The biological intensity of the Amazon rainforest creates many problems for the plants here. Competition between plants is fierce. Plants are always vying for light, leading some like the strangler fig to resort to violence. Besides all the plant infighting, there are also just so many herbivorous insects threatening to consume leaves that otherwise the plants could keep for about a decade. Oh wow, look how old some of these leaves are. They're just covered in moss and fungus and stuff. Yeah, because in the tropics, leaves just live for like a decade or something instead of a year, and so they become an ecosystem unto themselves, like everything here. That's why the tropics are so cool. Oh, you can see a uh, bit of a um, little invertebrate, a little caterpillar or fly or something, uh, chewed through this leaf. You can see where it's small when it was when it hatched from its egg, and then it grew and grew and grew and grew, and then eventually came out. Some larger animals can also be an issue. Macaws are seed predators, using crushing beaks to devour the next generation of plants. Hungry herbivores have driven plants to develop defenses to give them an edge out here. Remember the bamboo and their long spines? Well, quite a few plants in the Amazon have physical defenses like spines to discourage herbivory from large herbivores. Insects, of course, are probably a bigger problem due to their sheer quantity, and one strategy some plants use for protection against them is to become myrmecophiles, meaning they bribe the local ants to protect them. The ants savagely tear apart anything that lands on the plant and tries to eat it. Some can even use painful stings to ward off larger herbivores like these pseudomimrix ants on this tree. Besides a defense against herbivores, teaming up with ants can also give plants a competitive edge in the battle for sunlight. So this is clearly abandoned because there's a little katydid on it, but um, this is a Melastoma stacy with um, ant domatia on it. So ants can colonize these um, little expansions at the base of the petiole. And um, there's ants here that live in them, uh, particularly a kind of ant called the lemon ant. And those ants, they actually will poison the ground with their um, formic acid, and they'll kind of uh, turn the whole area of the forest into just a handful of species of plants, and it's like a really weird thing that, like, um, I guess was initially thought to be like, um, like according to local legend, was like evil spirits. But it's yeah, it's like because in the Amazon there's just so many different plant diversity, so yeah, it's kind of weird if you ran into an area with a handful of species of plants, and so um, yeah, there's these little gardens. Um, call, um, I've heard them called devil's gardens where they've only got like two or three species of plant and um, they're kind of centered around these plants with just these ant domatia and a species of ant that poisons the ground. Many plants though don't have a colony of angry ants protecting them and so have developed chemical weapons as a deterrent against herbivores. These toxins are scientifically known as secondary metabolites 
because they have nothing to do with growth or reproduction. They just float around uselessly in plant tissue until an animal eats them. Secondary metabolites can be broken into a few different categories, which because I am a biochemistry nerd, I will now be talking about for the next, who knows how long, probably most of the remaining runtime. First, we have the terpenes, that classic smell of pine trees, whether a Christmas tree, a car air refreshener, or some overpowering deodorant is due to terpenes. While terpenes can have a wide variety of defensive functions, from just a bitter taste, being the primary psychoactive component in cannabis, just plain toxic, which because have had to learn to eat clay in order to bypass, or cause you to cut off one of your ears, quite a few plants use it more as a glue. One such terpene is found in latex, which is a milky substance that coagulates when exposed to air, gumming up the chewing mouth parts of insects, or getting them stuck to the plant where they eventually starve. This is such an effective defense, some termites have independently evolved the same thing, able to spray sticky terpenes out of their head with a structure known as the fontanelle gun. Yeah, a little uh, termite nest, and then they have their little, their main structure, and then they got little pathways that they can take um, down into the soil, or looks like there were some that went up. This might be abandoned now. The next major group of secondary metabolites are phenolics, which are characterized by aromatic rings, from simple phenols to highly complex organic compounds, like tannins. Remember when I said put a pin in a discussion about tannins? Tannins are sort of a general defense that many plants in the Amazon produce, and their main function is basically making it more difficult for herbivores to digest the plant by disrupting digestive enzymes. Moving on to a different kind of secondary metabolite, alkaloids are often more specific and more toxic. These bitter tasting compounds include toxins like caffeine, nicotine, capsaicin, cocaine, and morphine, which mess with enzymes, nerve transmission, inhibit protein synthesis, and all sorts of other things most organisms prefer not to happen. I said most. I am not judging you for your consumption of alkaloids. Many people do it daily. Beyond these three main types of toxins, plants also use other secondary metabolites. Some, like cyanogenic glycosides and glucosinolates, are stored in the vacuole of plant cells and then released when they are broken down by the herbivore, causing inflammation, salivation, or in the case of cyanide, block cellular respiration, which, you know, is pretty bad usually. Other kinds of secondary metabolites are a bit rarer. Okay, okay, I have to fangirl over some biochemistry and talk about one of my fave secondary metabolites. There are some plants that make amino acids that are not one of the standard 20 most organisms use to build proteins. Generally taking one of these standard amino acids and adding an extra methyl group or some other bells and whistles like that, which gets ingested and incorporated into proteins like any other amino acid. But because they're not standard, this creates malformed proteins that cause cellular chaos in the herbivore. Like, isn't that crazy? I love biochem. Well, after that biochemistry high, we have to come back down and talk about deforestation. I'm sorry, but we do have to talk about it. Today, the Amazon rainforest is under unprecedented threat, meaning all of these botanical treasures and the rest of the biodiversity here is in danger of disappearing forever. Organizations like the Amazon Conservation Association or Amazon Aid Foundation work to protect the rainforest. The Amazon Conservation Association operates their own protected forests, and the Amazon Aid Foundation is working to take a holistic approach to combating deforestation, especially that from widespread gold mining, which I spent several weeks watch happen. Beyond giving money, there are also actions you can take personally to protect the Amazon. Back to gold, if you are purchasing gold jewelry, make sure it is coming from a responsible source and not some illegal rainforest mining camp, which to put in perspective, a single gold ring takes about 20 tons of Amazonian soil to produce, leading to large swaths of forests ripped out to get at the sediments below. Another major reason for deforestation in the Amazon is cattle ranching and soy production to feed livestock. So by reducing or completely cutting your consumption of meat, or at the very least making sure you actually know the source of the meat you are eating, you can help ensure a future for these forests. Thank you so much for watching this video to the bitter alkaloid end. Seriously, thank you so much. If you enjoyed learning about the flora and habitats of the Amazon rainforest, perhaps you might be interested in learning about some other botanical wonders, such as the tumbleweed, which spread their seeds once they die, or Pando, the largest and oldest tree on the planet.